the, the place that we're beginning may be a little Id idiosyncratic to the larger question of, of software governance in cars, but I don't think so idiosyncratic as to be uh, a, a poor beginning place. Uh, I'm, I'm shuffling here because what people gave me to use as biography readings is not in the order of presentation. And so I, I, I wanted to be sure I have my co-author right. The worst thing you can do in co-authorship is to introduce your co-author wrong. It leaves a lifetime of bitterness. So I'm reading off the page about my old friend, Mr. Shuttleworth. Mark founded Thought, an internet commerce security company in 1996 while studying finance and IT at the University of Cape Town, which had water back then. In 2000, he founded HBD, an investment company, and created the Shuttleworth Foundation to fund innovative leaders in society with a combination of fellowships and investments. Uh, exceptional people doing exceptional things. Um, every time I ever pointed somebody at him, I discovered it wasn't an exceptional enough person doing an exceptional enough thing. So Shuttleworth Foundation has very high standards and has indeed created a, 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 an opportunity for a lot of quite exceptional people. Um, he, 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 now we come to that. In 2002, he flew to the International Space Station as a member of the crew of Soyuz mission. I have never met a geek who wasn't in awe of that, I have to say, ever. Uh, the, the mission TM-34, after a year of training in Star City, Russia. Uh, after running a campaign to promote code, science, and mathematics and aspiring astronauts and other ambitious types at schools in South Africa, he started work on, on Ubuntu. Um, a small thing which did, in fact, revolutionize the usability of free software in people's personal computers all over the world. Um, tiny little thing. Uh, it, today, he lives on the lovely Mallard's Botanical Garden in the, lay, uh, in the Isle of Man, along with 18 ducks, uh, the equally lovely Claire, two black bitches, and the occasional itinerant sheep. Um, there are no sheep coming today. I promise you we are. We are, we are lions, not lambs here today. Um, uh, but, but on that uh, sound biographical basis, uh, I give you, uh, for the discussion of uh, copyleft and software governance in cars, Mark Shuttleworth. Eben, thank you very much um, for setting the stage for this discussion and for pulling this group together. Um, I want to say thank you for reading my entire biography because there are some things that you write at the end of a piece thinking no one's ever going to read them, but there we go. <laughs> um, it's very exciting to see the list of speakers today because it's always interesting to, to, to pull together people with widely different backgrounds but common problems because you get much more creativity that way. It's exciting also to be at a university because for me, universities are just wonderful places to kind of get out of the, the off the treadmill and into a space where, where creativity can happen. Uh, and it's exciting for me to be meeting people who have done great things in both commerce and free software, because I think the combination of those things is very powerful and very interesting. Um, we all have lucky breaks, and for me, possibly the biggest lucky break was finding what we now call free and open source software at just the right time. Uh, I was a student in a space like this, uh, very interested in things that were completely inaccessible from the tip of Africa, very interested in the internet, which had barely reached the tip of Africa, uh, very interested in cryptography, which was something that sort of very much happened in, in, in an international arena. And I was trying to kind of combine these interests uh, and not really making much progress until um, somebody handled me, handed me a, a stack of, of disks. Uh, and after quite a lot of wading through all of that, I found the raw materials to sort of explore those ideas. Uh, and together with a couple of other lucky breaks, uh, that worked, worked out really quite well. Uh, and so I found myself in the position to sort of explore interests of all sorts. And after some consideration, I came to the view that probably the most impactful way to, to, to spend the next couple of decades 
would be on enabling people to, to take their odd idiosyncratic interests and explore them faster. And it struck me that, that the, the, the raw materials that were available in free software um, uh, were a basis for innovation unlike anything we'd ever seen before. But there was a ton of friction, friction in, in um, the consumption of that, in the use of that. Uh, and that friction was essentially reducing the number of people that could innovate. Right? Uh, and so that's really how Ubuntu came to be. The idea was very, very simple. Um, how do we essentially connect people who are innovating in different ways in different places so that goodness can happen faster? Um, and uh, that's essentially how I came to be you know, interested in software delivery. Um, my interest in being here is not because I have any passion for cars, but it's simply for the, from the realization that that's going to be one of the places that software has to be delivered. Let me. See if this can all be made to work. So in this journey, you know, I started by pulling together a few, um, I thought, inspired developers from Debian uh, and other distributions. Um, and trying to solve this problem of friction, right? getting rid of all the things that had made it difficult to get to those raw materials effectively on which ideas could be explored. Uh, and that process you know, was really the, the founding of Ubuntu, the beginning of Ubuntu. Uh, and what it turned into was a platform that enabled people to go and break the rules or explore boundaries or push back boundaries really, really quickly. Uh, and looking back, it's kind of extraordinary to me today that every single one of these institutions, and this is a very small subset, has essentially moved to using Ubuntu as the platform on which they create their future. Uh, it's, very, it's very exciting to me because everybody who graduates from one of those businesses then takes that idea onward. Right? In a competitive world, the ability to innovate faster and to move faster is a competitive advantage. And so it's kind of like in a Darwinian environment, it's a very successful meme. So when I look at this picture, what I know is that this idea of spreading free software to spread uh, innovation, to accelerate innovation, is working. Um, but along the way, one also realizes that you know, as successful as something is, it always has limitations and problems. Uh, and we started to become aware of problems in, um, in the very, very nature of Linux, in the very nature of Ubuntu. Um, problems that really only showed up when you started to look at something at, at scale. Uh, remember, when we started, we were very focused on the developer, and a developer's in complete control of their environment, right? In fact, a developer wants a malleable environment, an environment where they can just pull whatever they need, rearrange it, turn it upside down, connect the dots in completely new ways, right? And so that's what we built. We built an environment that was enormously productive for developers. And then you extend that out to systems which are well administered. Uh, and so again, there's power and value in this flexibility and malleability. So a, a traditional system essentially consists of all the software that comes from somewhere else. It's, it has provenance associated with it. Uh, and then you mix it all together right, on your laptop, on your workstation, on your VM, and you make whatever you need, which is incredibly, incredibly powerful and efficient and fast. It's also messy. And so what we started to see was the consequences of the fact that Linux you know, enables the mixing of software. And so you don't really know what you've got when you're at, at a system. When you have hundreds of thousands of systems, Netflix, north of 100,000 VMs on any given day, you have hundreds of thousands of systems, that underlying uncertainty of what you actually have becomes friction. So we started out trying to solve friction for developers, and we found ourselves increasingly engaged by people to try to help them solve uh, questions of friction in the system itself. Right? If I've got hundreds of thousands of systems, 
I now have questions of friction when I'm upgrading and changing. What have I actually got? All these things interact with each other. All these packages you can write anywhere. We also had another concern, which is people said, well, what can a bad piece of software do, right? Because just like any package that comes from a trusted source can go anywhere, so can a package that's perhaps shouldn't be trusted. So that got us thinking about the question of trust. Like, what does it really mean to trust software? And we realized, you know, we generally have, and certainly in the community, we have very naive ideas about what it means to trust software. We've done an enormous amount of work in Ubuntu uh, and in Debian and in other, you know, in, uh, upstream projects to sort of establish provenance of code all the way through build processes down onto the disk. But all of that is lost when effectively you start mixing and spreading software around. It's very hard to know what to trust. There are ways, there have been ways since the early 2000s to, to write complicated rules about exactly what any piece of software can do, but they're so arcane and so complicated that in practice, nobody uses them. And they're also ultimately limited by the fact that because anything can legitimately go anywhere or have gone anywhere, it's very hard to really write rules that you can count on. The insight at the time that I recall was that it didn't matter so much whether or not you trusted the software. The question was what you trusted it with. We're all starting to mix software from lots of different places onto our systems. Phones, laptops, servers, VMs. That's not going to change. This idea that all the software will come through one funnel and get curated and managed, that's old. Now software is going to come from lots and lots and lots of different places. And it's not really a reasonable option as a developer or as a business to say, I'm, I'm not going to trust anything that doesn't come from one place. Because from a Darwinian point of view, you'll be costing yourself access to innovation. So you have to start asking the different questions. What am I going to trust that software with? And so that led us to being in the software delivery game a new approach to essentially putting software on those systems, which is to say, let's put it there, but put it in a box. And instead of mixing it in and then trying to write complicated rules about how it's being mixed in, let's just not mix it in. Let's just keep software that comes from other places in a box, because then we know what we're trusting it with. And so that got us started thinking about new ways to effectively put boundaries around what a piece of software on a system is doing. And so as things do, they lead to one another. Very, very quickly, Ubuntu started to spread in all of these mushy, elastic environments. Uh, more than half of the private clouds that are built with Linux uh, are built with Ubuntu. Nearly two-thirds of all of the workloads on the public cloud are Ubuntu. And that was all going swimmingly. We were starting to sort of try to solve these problems. And we realized the next thing was going was to ratchet these problems up by one or two orders of magnitude. And that was the Internet of Things. Uh, we saw this you know, advanced wave. We get this early warning because we know what developers are doing with Ubuntu, what they're asking us to do with Ubuntu. And we saw this very clear signal that effectively uh, the next wave of innovation was going to be out at the edge on devices. And there are all sorts of interesting things there, but we, we realized that the problems we were dealing with at the level of hundreds of thousands of VMs were going to be significantly compounded um, if you got up to a few billion devices. And the, 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 the approaches that we were trying to take, we're going to struggle to scale. You know, there's a, there's a cost associated with the server, and it's considered a reasonable cost. In other words, having people devoted to servers and a ratio of people to servers is actually a cost on every server, if you want to think of it that way. And that cost just simply wouldn't work out at the edge with cameras and... Um, GSM towers and cheap devices. Right? So all of these problems, we're going to have to find fundamentally better technology, fundamentally better ways to attack them. Um, and so we said, well, instead of just having this, the, the system built the old way with, with mixed up files and then external applications confined, what if we try to build the entire system the same way? And so... Uh, we eventually came to a view that we need to publish two versions of Ubuntu at the same time with exactly the same content, just delivered differently. So in this latter version of Ubuntu, edition effectively, 
instead of having all of those files that make up you know, the root file system and the kernel and everything, we end up with very, very few files. We end up with one big zip file that's the kernel. We end up with another very big zip file that's the entire operating system, effectively the base operating system. And then we end up with those applications in their boxes. In other words, we take this idea of, of bounding the trust of some software uh, and having that software effectively always in a protected um, signed format and extend that to the entire device. Um, tricky, as you can imagine. There's a lot of illusion, there's a lot of magic in the Linux kernel now, a lot of the, the tools to create magic, to create illusions effectively. So that for that software, the fact that they're in this um, entirely different packaging format is invisible. Right? To an app written to run on the left, uh, it's not that hard actually to have it work just as well on the right <laughs> because we can create the illusion to it that effectively everything is as it was before. But from, a, from an ownership and op uh, an operations point of view, we essentially bring a whole lot of new characteristics to the platform. The first is that we never ever lose track of provenance. So, just like we can get hashes on git commits which tell us who wrote a line of code, and we can then take that through to various build systems that give us certainty of the relationship between where the code came from and where the binaries came from. Right. What we used to lose was a lot of that provenance when we unpacked the packages and spread those files around. But now, we're never unpacking those packages. Essentially, all the files associated with an app or all the files associated with an operating system are in one zip file. And that zip file never changes. So we can sign it and we can check the signature when we install it and the next day and the next day. We always know where everything came from. We can, we can essentially allow people to share information about software knowing that they're sharing that information about exactly the same software. So if somebody's tested the software, they can say so. And everybody can know that. If somebody's proven that two pieces of software work together, they can say so. And everybody knows that. And they know that forever. It isn't a hint. It's a fact. It's a mathematical binding, effectively. We get this deep sense of rigor around software. The integrity of the software can be validated. And permissions can be asserted in a way that is mathematically consistent or mathematically um, uh, attested. So signatures and assertions. Assertions are, are the term for those mathematical statements effectively, digitally signed documents, GPG, open GPG, signed documents. We also get some operational primitives. So because these pieces of software are never unpacked, we can keep multiple versions of them very, very cleanly because we, we're not spreading files around the system and then getting a new version and starting to spread the files. In a, it, you know, when we do that with traditional packaging, we're always in this slightly dangerous stage where we might have put down some of the new files when the power goes out and now we're not sure exactly what we've got. In this world, uh, you know you're always running this version or you're running that version and you're running that version in its entirety. Perhaps more importantly, you can go back. So we can essentially keep multiple versions of software on a device and choose, are we going to use this version or that version? So we have this very precise sense of going forward and going back, um, which is part of that, so that, 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 that attack on the underlying operational complexity and cost of having billions of devices. Right? It's expensive to administer software because things go wrong. If we can attack the places where things go wrong, we can dramatically reduce the cost of administering software. And almost everything now is going to be ultimately tied to software and carry that cost. Um, we can express the relationship between pieces of software. So if somebody says, look, I've got a piece of software that needs a database, we can allow them to say that they've tested it with that version of a database. And so we can have this very precise sense of what should work and what shouldn't. And when somebody is legally bound, 
when, for example, somebody's warranties apply and when they don't. They apply when they've made a commitment. But that commitment isn't fuzzy anymore. That commitment is really, really precise and really um, easy to manage effectively. So in these sorts of systems, you observe this great behavior where an app can be installed, a database can be installed, uh, an update for the database can be available, but it won't automatically be applied because the app that's depending on that database has said, look, I haven't yet tested with that database. So there's an update available, there's a, there's a, there's a better version of the database um, available, but because the app hasn't yet said we've, we're, we're, we're good with that, it won't automatically update. Only when the app says we've tested that will it update. Of course, as the user, you have the right to say, no, no, I really need that update. I don't believe that that testing is going to take place or I can't wait for it, I'll take the risk or I'll take the risk on this device. So we get very nice frameworks for different entities, the publishers of software, the manufacturers of the device, the owners of the device, to express what they want and to manage the inherent tensions or rights in their relationship. We also get really interesting primitives for integration. Remember, none of these pieces of software can simplistically read or write to the same file by default. So the integration between pieces of software becomes very, very interesting. First, there is no integration by default. So nothing can simplistically assume that it can poke at something else. The only ways to integrate are, again, through those digitally signed documents. The only ways to integrate are by saying, it is necessary for me to be able to talk to something else in this way and for the system to agree, the system being a representation of what the manufacturer thinks and potentially what the owner of that, of that system effectively thinks. And we can mediate that. So these lines of communication only, they aren't arbitrary. They're, they have to be shaped and designed and agreed. They can also be mediated. In other words, two pieces of software may think they're talking directly to each other, but actually they may be talking through something which asserts policy on the conversation. Yes, these two things are allowed to talk. Yes, they will think they are talking directly to each other. But in fact, there can be something else which is working to a policy which says, if they start talking about things which are outside of policy, we can stop that line of communication. And these primitives are essentially profoundly new ways of thinking about software delivery. The technology underneath all of this is the same sorts of capabilities that power Docker, that power, um, uh, have powered digital signatures for a long time. The, the, this is, as with all kinds of work, um, essentially a small step being taken on top of the work of many, many different people. But bringing it all together, specifically focused on software governance and software delivery is, for us, profoundly interesting. In the end, I think what we're entering is a time where we can have really rigorous and, and, and reasoned, a really rigorous and reasoned view of software security and governance. And to that I would add trust. So, what about GPLv3? Now, Evan and I have had the opportunity to, 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 to discuss, debate, and work together on a number of different issues. Um, uh, and I approached Evan because I really wanted to understand the GPLv3 because increasingly I was getting anxious questions from uh, partners, customers about the GPLv3. Um, uh, and the question was always basically the same, which is, um, uh, can we avoid it or what? Right. Uh, now, it's very, very clear to me that um, the freedoms inherent in free software are the real driver of the innovation that ultimately I've benefited from and others have benefited from. I think it's important that there's a diverse set of approaches to open source, but if you would ask me where I stand, I'd say I'm always gonna bet on the, 
on the meme that ultimately drives innovation furthest. There's this, there's this old question, you know, what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object? Um, I think quite clearly, copy left and with it GPLv3 is an unstoppable force. I watch where it's going, who's adopting it, and the dependencies between those. In my view, it's an unstoppable force. The apparently immovable object is an industrial view that it's somehow dangerous and unacceptable. Um, but as an investor and, and as a betting person, I will always bet on the company or the team that has access to the bigger pool of innovation. And so in these conversations, clearly, I, my job is to work with people to get them to where they need to be. Uh, it's perfectly straightforward for us to deliver capabilities that exclude GPLv3 code to customers and partners who wish to exclude GPLv3 code. That's, that's not hard. That's what they want. I can support and facilitate that. And I can do it with rigorous governance and trust. Um, but the reason I'm really interested in this, in this conversation is because I think that is the losing strategy for those parties. Because they will be excluding themselves from the mainstream track of innovation. And they will face competition from perhaps more forward-looking institutions who will ride the full wave of that innovation. And so that's where, where Eben and I started to talk because the question for me was really, can we use some of these new primitives to manage the rights and responsibilities that are created in these contracts in an elegant way, in a way that takes an unstoppable force meeting an immovable object and creates space effectively, not for compromise, but for productive forward motion. And I think that, I hope that that's a useful grounding. I hope that these uh, are useful primitives. And I hope that the diverse opinions here today, uh, that we can effectively find ways to bridge um, uh, perspectives, bridge requirements. Uh, everybody has legitimate requirements, absolutely, and people have different views. But I think what's always interesting to me is that the successful people and companies are the ones who find a way to move forward. Um, I think that's it. Yes, yeah, so ultimately, while our focus has been on uh, the bits, the mechanisms here equally speak to the rights, right? In our thinking, it's very clear that there are multiple parties working in a device. You know, think of that projector. It's a manufacturer. There may be apps from, from vendors. The university has rights. Managing what the software can do and what we trust the software with is, in a way, a different way of thinking about managing the rights of all of those parties. Anyway, Eben, thank you for the opportunity and for pulling this group together. source of the thinking is quite well. If you begin re-architecting how you distribute all the packages in a distribution in such a way that you have both a, a, a kind of acid... Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. But you are. Uh, if you, if you re-architect a, a distribution of software so that you have uh, e effectively isolated both the code that runs in read-only condition, uh, and you have given yourself the opportunity to update and roll back in a controlled fashion without breaking dependencies, then you have the possibility of an agent within each computer in a device that can govern the software, can report exactly what is running, can report exactly when it was installed and what it replaced, and can, under appropriate circumstances, undo some portion of any existing install, knowing that breakage cannot occur. You have used digital signatures to assert uh, in a, a testable fashion all of those pieces, 
and you have architected the operating system so that the inter-process communications and communications with other devices on a network are all controlled at a high level of granularity, program by program, function by function. And once again, you have stated all of that in documents which are simple to read, but which are impossible to forge because they are digitally signed by somebody with authority to determine at low level, beyond even role in the sort of security enhanced Linux sense, uh, interaction by interaction with devices and other processes on a network which are permitted and which are not. This now gives, as Mark says, a set of primitives for using copyleft, even copyleft which requires that the user be allowed to request installation information to change the software for herself in a very controlled setting. So as you see in the paper that we wrote about this, suppose we imagine ourselves in a vehicle in which uh, the, the OEM's view of how the media player should work is not the parent's view of how the media player should work. A, a, a phenomenon I think is likely to occur um, in, in cars with video screens and honking devices in them and so on. The manufacturer's version of the media player may be one which an individual auto, owner of an automobile wishes to change. She's good at that kind of stuff. Maybe that's even what she works on. She'd like to be able to modify the media player in a car. The media player as distributed by the OEM may actually have some integration with parts of the vehicle operation, which it would not be a very good idea to permit another version of the software to capitalize upon. Safety might be compromised if, for example, the media player's relationship to control electronics is uh, hijacked. Um, but it is possible for the manufacturer to respond under GPL3 to a request for installation information in the following form. Here uh, is a set of assertions signed by us for the vehicle with VIN number such and such. Uh, and the software governance agent will install a modified version if you provide this assertion for it. Uh, and it will do everything that can be done by the media player in this automobile except one or two things which um, uh, our version can do, but we believe that a modified version that did those things could compromise the operation of the network or the safety of the vehicle, which GPL3 makes a, a, a ground for a manufacturer's exception for installation information. Modified versions must work on the network in the same way that unmodified versions must, unless there is a problem in compromising the network or the safety of the, vehicle, uh, of the device. So now the manufacturer says, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let you modify that media player. You can do pretty much anything the media player can do except one or two things that, that I think are safety involving. Uh, and here's the installation information that will allow you to do that in your vehicle. And I'm publishing that I've given uh, a, a modification exception for this software in this VIN so that everybody can be sure that any modification to your vehicle software which occurred was made by you and not by some hostile third party. Um, all of this then can be operated even more sensitively than that in the sense that this is just one more version being managed by those rollback primitives. It's possible for the vehicle to work in such a way that when it pulls onto a smart road or is in some other technically demanding environment, user modifications could be temporarily rolled back and then automatically reinstalled when that condition is no longer present. It becomes possible, in other words, to govern the software and the vehicle with high levels of accountability and extraordinarily high levels of granularity thus allowing a manufacturer or any other party who controls the particular issuance of assertions for the software in the vehicle to determine exactly how users' rights are balanced against other interests, regulatory interests, security interests, the, the legal interests of the manufacturer giving permission, and so forth. If even the most determined activist free software license, the one that everybody wants to know, can we avoid this because rights for users? I mean, really? If everybody can actually come to grips with the possibility, yeah, that will work, right? We, we, we have technical machinery at the level at which we package and distribute our software, which gives us for free, as it were, all the governance aspects that we would need in order to make that work. 
so that we both can tell what the state of the modified software is in the vehicle at every, in every computer at every time. We can pull it out in order to do warranty service or to prove as we used to do on a 360 mainframe, right? When IBM's SE showed up and you said, man, I got a big problem. They say, okay, pull your mods and prove that it works on our software. That was easy for SEs to demand of big companies when I was a kid programmer working on mainframe software. Nobody has ever thought we could do that with laser printers and home routers and stuff like that, but we now can, right? What Mark is talking about is a way of governing software at a granular enough level that we can actually say, okay, you know, the, the software should be rolled back to base state to prove what it is that's going on here, and then we can reinstall user-modified software bit by bit, function by function, place by place, context by context. And the manufacturer issues a document when he permits modification, which says exactly what modification I am permitting, in the sense that I'm allowing this code to work every bit as much as the old code did, except for whatever it is which is particularly sensitive to safety or the operation of the vehicle. This, this, I think, is what we have. Mark has explained why it is that we have it. That is, how that is part of a much larger process of trying to figure out how to deliver software under 21st century. And we have it for a common project, which I think we both care deeply about for the reasons he has offered. If we are to keep user innovation in this world of automotive devices, we need to be able to allow user modification. I am concerned that the alternative is a world in which we do not permit users, that is, people, to have any rights in automobiles. As we point out in the paper, there is a broad public policy coalition now building around the world under the rubric of shared mobility principles, sharedmobilityprinciples.org. Um, a, a fine set of public policy recommendations about how we ought to think about shared mobility in cities of the future, in which, if you will look, a whole bunch of world governments and a whole bunch of uh, commercial organizations are signed up for point 10 in dense urban cores around the world. No private party should be allowed to own a self-driving vehicle, only fleets. Oh, uh, why, you say, should well, Zipcar's founder is one of the major movers in sharedmobilityprinciples.org, but, but for, not for oligopolization principle, not, not for anti-competitive reasons. Why, one might buy, why, why would one bar private ownership? Oh, because software governance is going to be such a nightmare, and we can't trust people to maintain the software in their cars correctly. Only Uber will know how to Now, 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 this is why, from my point of view, whether you're interested in cars or not, you, you, you face one of these questions about the fate of users' rights in the 21st century that contains an awful lot of political importance, at least for people like me. That we are now actually confronting the question, can we achieve important social goals, safety, reduction of li limitation of liability, understanding of the unintended consequences of technology without extinguishing all the freedom that the car created in the first place for human beings? Are we really going to turn this into an oligopolized service conducted over appliances you can't understand, can't mess with, can't change? Can't it, 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 that, that fate, it's way worse than the removal of the carburetor and its replacement by fuel injection and the, the reduction of the ability to tinker with the engine in order to achieve cleaner air. This is a much more profound and much more complicated trade-off. What I understand Mark and his colleagues at Canonical to have done in the evolution of SNAP packaging is to have given us, as he says, the primitives for the kind of governance that can compromise these social goals in a period of rapid technological transformation in which, as usual, everybody is moving very fast and breaking a lot of things, but they're not actually understanding where the real dangers, technical or social, are. That, that was why this work seemed to us to be so important and why it seemed to me worth gathering people around to think about it. The, the most important kinds of people to think about it are the, well, the people who think about making cars and having free software in them, which is why the next presentation has to be by Daniel Putnayak. It, it, it's that, that's how we have to have this conversation. 